It's Acts chapter 26. We only have a couple of chapters left, and I'm excited because Paul's coming to the end of his life. He's, uh, I'm not excited that he's coming to the end of his life, and I'm excited that God used him so greatly in bringing to us the gospel to the Gentiles, how God took Paul. Uh, let's review a little bit since it's kind of the end of the, uh, end of the book. But as you recall, uh, Jesus said that the early disciples were to tarry, where they were to wait in Jerusalem for the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, he promised in John 16, he said, I will not leave you comfortless, but I will come to you. And he told the disciples that. He said, I'm going to leave. It's necessary for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come to you. But when he has come, he'll guide you into all truth. And so Jesus knew it was necessary for him to leave for the church to rise up with the same anointing, same power that he had. Uh, well, he left, as we know, after the resurrection, the ascension. And, uh, and then on that great day of Pentecost, the power of God fell. Actually, in Acts 1, uh, verse 8, uh, Luke wrote this great verse, You shall receive power after the Holy Spirit's come upon you. You shall be my witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And that's exactly the outline of the book of Acts. It began in Jerusalem with Peter, and Peter as the head of the church and the center of the church was in Jerusalem, the first 10 chapters of, of Acts, and all of the activities seemed to be around Jerusalem. Uh, the day of Pentecost, the tongues fell upon the early church. Uh, the 120 in the upper room began to speak in the languages of all the Jews that had come to Jerusalem for the day of Pentecost, and that was a language use of tongues, which was is one of the forms of tongues that God gives. Uh, I've heard stories, actually, of people speaking in foreign languages and not knowing the language. Uh, I've heard stories of that. I've never seen it personally, but I've heard it happening. So it's possible that it, God can supernaturally give a language to people in a time of great need. And so in the day of Pentecost, that power fell. Now, remember, it's really interesting. The day of Pentecost was fully come, and then the place was filled. The people still hadn't been filled. So the first thing that God filled was the day, and the second thing that God filled was a room, and the third thing that God filled was the people. <laughs> and the Holy Spirit descended upon them, uh, came upon them, and the tongues of fire rested upon each one. They went down into the streets, and they took the gospel. They preached the gospel. And then Peter got up and got, gave that great sermon. And he started the church of Jerusalem with 3,000 members right off the street. That's a pretty good start. And uh, out of that, uh, a lot of more con converts happened. The early church basically met in homes. It says the apostles continued steadfastly day by day from house to house, uh, breaking bread and fellowshipping with the saints. And the early church, even though it was a large church, was basically meeting in homes, uh, even though they did use uh, the synagogue periodically. And the Jews, many Jews believe, by the way, but the Jewish nation itself did not fully receive the gospel. In fact, God gave three opportunities to the Jews to repent. In the early part of the book of Acts, three times God compassionately pled with the Jewish nation that they should receive their Messiah. But it all ended with the stoning of Stephen. They finally closed the door to the gospel to, the, to Israel with the stoning of Stephen. It was kind of the last straw. And who was standing over Stephen as he was stoned? It was the Apostle Paul. Paul was standing and he was actually holding the robes of some of the Jewish leaders that were throwing the stones. He watched Stephen die. He had, that had to speak to Paul. To see the face of Stephen, it says, was like an angel. Kind of blew the minds of the religious leaders. They saw him, and he didn't whimper. He didn't cry. He saw Jesus standing, hello, standing to welcome him home. Wouldn't that be exciting for Jesus to stand, uh, not be just sitting on the throne, but to stand to welcome you home? And so Stephen had that glorious uh, death, death, that martyr's death, but Paul the Apostle stood over, uh, over Stephen, and we're going to hear in his testimony today before Agrippa as he gives a little bit of the history of his own conversion. And by the way, he's going to give the steps that people go through for conversion. I think it's very interesting, uh, this chapter, chapter 26. And, and so we know, know that uh, from chapter 10, verse 1, actually Paul's conversion was in verse chapter 9. And his whole conversion story was in nine verses. Isn't that amazing? God is the greatest storyteller. <laughs> God can tell an account in a few verses. Do you know the entire creation is told in 32 verses in Genesis? You know, if people wrote a book about creation today, it'd be thousands of pages long. It'd be actually bigger probably than the health uh, bill that's going out of Washington. <laughs> but it would be big. God told the whole story in, in 32 verses. <laughs> 
So, you know, I'll tell you, I love the Bible. The Bible is so powerful because every verse has depth and content and a lot of information in it. And if you go verse by verse through the Bible as we're doing, you, you discover a lot. We ha- kind of have to move, we have to move quickly to cover a chapter a day, but we're having a lot of fun doing it because we're getting an overview, but we get the context of what God is saying. And so, Uh, We have Paul now from chapter 10 through the end of the book of Acts. The church moved from Jerusalem to Antioch. The center moved from Jerusalem to Antioch. Now, remember in Paul's conversion, he was not allowed to go to Jerusalem. God knew that if, if Paul went to Jerusalem, he'd come under the influence of the Jewish believers there. Because God was giving Paul a different gospel, not a different gospel, but a different approach to the gospel, and that was the gospel of grace. The gospel of the law had finished with with the Jewish nation. Uh, that, that no longer was working. Circumcision was no longer important. Now it was a circumcision to the heart. And God took Paul into the desert to teach him the revelation of the church, the gospel of grace. And Paul ended up in, in Gaul, in the ancient, among the ancient people of the Gauls, which was really France. And he started all the churches of Galatia. And uh, he spent three years there just starting churches in Galatia. He hadn't even gone to Jerusalem yet. And so Paul was not allowed to go to Jerusalem. In fact, at Paul's conversion, Jesus said Jerusalem would not receive him. It was not God's intent for Paul to minister in Jerusalem. But you know what? He went anyway. He went out of the will of God, out of the perfect will of God. We read about that in chapters 25 and 26, or 24 and 25, how he went and he was only there 12 days. And already a riot had risen up, and 40 men took a vow that they would not eat or drink until they killed Paul. And Paul's sister had a son, uh, his nephew, that heard these 40 men talk. And so he went to the Roman ca- captain, and he said, listen, there's a, there, there's a conspiracy to kill Paul. And when you deliver him to the Jewish council tomorrow, these 40 men are lying in wait, and they're going to kill Paul. And, of course, it greatly concerned the centurion, or the Jewish guards, because they knew they were liable for Roman citizens. They knew that because Paul was from Tyre of Sidon, he was a legitimate Roman citizen. Isn't God gracious in what he calls people? He calls them with exactly the right credentials. And Paul had the right credentials to get this job done. That is to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. Aren't you glad that the gospel came to the Gentiles? I'm glad because I'm a Gentile, uh, technically, uh, although I'm, I'm of Abraham's seed, spiritually, I'm a Gentile uh, in the natural. And so God brought the gospel to us. And so we really have in the latter part of the book of Acts still that transition happening. The Jewish leaders are still conspiring to kill Paul. They hate this message. They knew Paul. They knew Saul of Tarsus before. They knew that he was well trained under Gamaliel the prophet. They knew that he had he had a he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was one of the top real rulers in Jerusalem. I mean, th- th- this man Paul was probably the mo- one of the most credentialed Pharisees of the day. So to see somebody from their very ranks turn to this one named Jesus Christ and then begin to preach Christ and preach the resurrection was a real offense to the Jewish leaders. Now, Ananias probably was the worst high priest that Israel ever had. Uh, he, he was a wicked man. Uh, he, was, he, he just led this whole conspiracy. And he was doing everything he could. He took a group up to Felix, we found in chapter 25, and and with Felix, he tried to convince Felix to bring Paul back to Jerusalem so those 40 men could still kill him because they'd missed the first time. But you know what? Felix was wise enough not to do that. He kept Paul in Caesarea. And that brings us now to Acts chapter 26, where he now took Paul before Agrippa. And we have that great uh, story of Paul and Agrippa, where Agrippa made one of the great statements of the New Testament. Paul, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. <laughs> I heard a Billy Graham sermon one time on that very verse. Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Uh, so Agrippa, by the way, knew a lot about the Jewish law. He knew the Old Testament, Paul said. He said, you're well versed, you're well studied in the Jewish traditions. And so when Paul, as we're going to see here in chapter 26, was speaking to Agrippa, uh, he, he told Agrippa, he says, you know well the prophets. Evidently, Agrippa had, had enough exposure to the Jewish people that he learned the, Jew, the ways of the Jews. And uh, so this this Jew, this Roman leader, Agrippa, now was, was before uh, Felix, and, and now uh, Festus actually had, I'm getting a little complicated, but I'll make it simple. Festus took over where Felix left off. Felix resigned as governor, and Festus took over. But anyway, Paul is now delivered 
to Agrippa, and he's making his way to Rome because God had promised Paul that he would go to Rome, that he would be in, before Caesar. Now, if you feel like you're called to witness before high pe- places and high people in high places, uh, get ready because you may well do it as a prisoner <laughs> because that's how Paul did it. Almost all of his witnessing to the Jewish uh, leaders as well as the government, the Roman leaders, was through bondage, through him going to prison. And they didn't know what to do with Paul. Poor Agrippa, he was trying to find a reason. And Felix, they were trying to find a reason to send him to Caesar. I mean, they could not just send Paul to Caesar without a cause. And over and over again, they said, uh, you know, this man has not done nothing worthy of bondage, of prison, much less of death. They just couldn't understand why the Jewish leaders wanted him dead. And I just say it again, religion hates Jesus. Religion fights Jesus. If you go to the nations, you'll find the greatest thing that fights the gospel is religion. And that's what Paul found in his day. And uh, we don't talk about religion on this program. We talk about relationship. We talk about being personally related to Jesus Christ. We talk about uh, the true true church, which is the body of Jesus Christ that has come under the rulership of Jesus, that is found through the blood of Christ, forgiveness of sins, and that is in vital relationship to Jesus. So, well, I said all this to lead us up to 26. And so let's read a little bit here out of out of Acts chapter 26 quickly. And then Agrippa said to Paul, "Thou art permitted, or thou art permitted to speak for yourself." And Paul stretched forth his hand and answered for himself. I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day before you, touching all the things where I'm accused of the Jews, especially because I know you to be an expert in all the customs and questions of of the Jews. Wherefore, I beseech you to hear me patiently. My manner of life from my youth, which was at first in my own nation, in Jerusalem, uh, knowing all the Jews, which knew me from the beginning, that if they would testify that after the most strictest sect of religion, I lived a Pharisee. And now I stand and I am judged for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers, unto which promise the twelve tribes instantly serving God day and night hope to come, for which hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused of the Jews. Why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? You know, God raised the dead in the Old Testament. The Jewish leaders knew that. Elijah had raised the dead. They knew that resurrection was a possibility. They just didn't like the resurrection of Jesus. They'd killed him. The same council that that, uh, put John to death, John the Baptist, the same council that put Jesus to death, the same council that put Peter to death, the same council that tried to put Paul to death, all this is the same Jewish council, and and they were the ones that tried to stop, tried to stop the gospel. And, of course, uh, we know what happened. Uh, they, they accused uh, the early apostles of turning the world upside down. By the way, that's what we ought to be doing. Uh, I hope people say, man, you're just turning the world upside down for Jesus. That, <laughs> that's what we should be doing. And so uh, Paul gets this whole thing. But I want to get into the latter part because our time is really going quickly here. But he says, you know, I, I persecuted the Christians. He says, I know. I know what, they're, what the Jewish leaders are doing. By the way, that's why Paul knew how to handle himself in front of the Jewish council, and he'd start an argument always between the Jewish leaders and the Sadducees, because the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection, and the Jewish nation knew there was a resurrection, so uh, he'd get them arguing with each other, and that relieved uh, himself a couple of times from being taken captive. But Paul knew he was very intelligent, and he was very wise when he handled himself in front of the council. And then he said, I thought myself... uh, that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus, which thing I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests, and when they were put to death, I gave voice over them, and I punished them often from every synagogue, compelled them to, to blaspheme, and being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them, even unto the strange cities. He, he said, I even went beyond the natural cities. He said, I was so passionate about getting rid of this Christian sect under the rulership of Jesus Christ. He said that I even traveled out of Jerusalem into some remote places searching for Christians that said they were Jews so I could uh, kill them and, and imprison them. Whereupon as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priest, at midday, O king, I saw the way of light from heaven above the brightness of the sun shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. And when they were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me, saying in the Hebrew tongue. Now, uh, my verse, uh, the Bible has this in red. So this is Jesus speaking. These are the words of Jesus. And what did Jesus say to Paul or to Saul? Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? 
it's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Now, a prick was a uh, was a goad type of thing that was used with the oxen. If you were driving a, a, a team of oxen, you would use this goad to make them move. And uh, Jesus kind of was <laughs> goading Paul through, I, I believe, when he saw Seasons, uh, or, or Stephen's uh, martyrdom, uh, it was one of the pricks that hit Paul's heart. When he thought back about what he had done, I believe all these things God used to show Paul the right way. And you know, if you're not born again, God will send you messengers. He'll send you circumstances. He'll allow things to happen in your life to get your attention. He wants you to come to Jesus. God will do everything he can to make a way for you to find the Lord. And and then I said, Paul said, who art thou, Lord? And he said, I'm Jesus whom you persecute. Now, isn't it interesting that Jesus said, when you touch his church, you touch him. He said, Paul, you were persecuting me. When you were killing these Christians, imprisoning these Christians, you were literally persecuting me. But he said to Paul, but rise and stand up on your feet, for I have appeared unto you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness, both of these things which you have seen and those things in which I will appear unto you, delivering you from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom I shall now send you. Now listen to verse 18. I love this because our guest today, we're going to be talking about that. Why did I send you, Paul, to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Boy, is, that verse 18 is loaded, isn't it? Isn't that, a power, isn't that a powerful verse? <laughs> Our guests are nodding their head yes. Let me read that again. Paul, I have sinned you to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, and to receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Wherefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but showed first uh, them unto Damascus and Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea, then to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God and do the works that are meet for repentance. And for these causes the Jews caught me in the temple and went about to kill me. Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue to this day witnessing both to small and great, saying none other such things than that which the prophets and Moses said should come, that Jesus should suffer. Now, see, I like Paul. Every time that he's put before a council, he starts giving the gospel. He tells the gospel story. You know what? If you're put in a situation, you know, use it as an opportunity to give out the gospel. That's what these early apostles did. When they appeared before judges and councils and leaders, they always preached Christ. And so Paul said that Christ should suffer, that he should be first, that should be risen from the dead, and should show light to the people and to the Gentiles. And as he spake for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside yourself. Now, isn't it interesting? The minute he said the word Gentiles, Festus reacted just the same as the Jewish council did that attacked Paul in, in Jerusalem. The minute Paul said, I'm taking this gospel to the Gentiles, a riot broke out. And the same thing happened with Festus. Anybody that knew. Now, put yourself here in these Jewish men's shoes for a moment. Imagine somebody came to your church and said your church was absolutely wrong, was going the wrong direction. I mean, they came on a Sunday morning and they said, your church no longer knows the way. There's a new way. And, and now your church is 100 years old, one of the historic uh, churches in the city. And, and, you, and you've been well versed in the doctrine of the church. So you can understand that the Jewish people that didn't have the enlightenment of the Holy Spirit would react. And even these leaders that were over the Jewish people said, you're mad, Paul. What are you talking about this gospel going to the Gentiles? Yet, you know, God's going to get this thing done. God's going to get the gospel to the Gentiles. This was a transition. I mean, we're talking about a transition from the entire Old Testament into a new thing, into a gospel that no longer requires you to keep the law. In fact, if you read Galatians, it says, if you come under the law, you've fallen from grace, Galatians chapter 5. And yet churches today will try to put you under the law. Well, let me tell you, if Christ sets you free, you're free indeed. Now, grace has a higher demand than the law. I want to tell you, you say, Jerry, you know what? If you just live by grace, you're going to sin. No, you won't. You know what? If you have a gracious husband or a gracious wife, you're going to love them more. 
that if, instead of them walking into the house and say, get over here and sit down and fix this. And, and listen, why don't you have my meal on the table? And uh, I wanted a six o'clock. No, I wanted a six oh five every night. <laughs> you know, there were, how many ceremonial? Oh, that. <laughs> Tom is pointing to Gary. Now, uh, how many ceremonial laws there were? Nobody could keep all those laws. And the law did nothing. It was a schoolmaster to sin. Wasn't the gospel of grace a good news? Well, when, when, this, when Paul brought this gospel, man, everybody should have rejoiced. But, boy, I tell you, these people that were bent in tradition did not like the change. They didn't like the fact that they could no longer control the people, that people could actually get free in Jesus Christ. That didn't work with their theology. And, you know, you see people even today that try to keep other people under bondage. Listen, it's not of God. But Paul said in Galatians, if any man preach any other gospel than that which I've given unto you, let him be a curse. Whether he's an angel from heaven or so-called a great man from earth, let him be accursed. So this is the gospel that God has given. So first of all, Paul said, I lived a Pharisee. Second, he said, I saw the light. He had a wonderful conversion on the road to Damascus. Then he said, I heard a voice. Faith cometh by what? Hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's what Galcom is all about. Getting the word of God out to the nations in the languages of the world. We'll find out about it in a few moments. And then he says, I was not disobedient. You know, you can hear the word of God, but you've got to receive it. You, you have to respond by faith to it. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Paul could have resisted the message of Jesus. He said, well, I, I, you know, I don't know who you are, but listen, I, I, I want out of here. <laughs> you know, I, I've got to get, I, I'm late. I've got to get to Damascus and kill some more Christians. No, he was obedient to the heavenly vision. Praise God. Praise God. that, and, and I think that's why it had to be so radical with Paul. You know, when he became blinded, I believe that blindness was a way of showing Paul how he had been blind to the truth. And until those scales fell off of his eyes. Uh, he couldn't really receive fully the message. So God had a way of dealing with him. And God has a way of dealing with you. Maybe maybe there's a way that God has been speaking to your heart. And maybe your business has gone through some trials. Or maybe you're in a relationship. Or maybe your marriage is falling apart. Or maybe uh, things are happening in your finances. Or things are just happening in your life. And it's, it's like, man, uh, how am I going to get out of this situation? And not that God causes this. I believe Satan can cause it. But God will allow these things sometimes to happen so you'll get, you'll get your attention toward God. I think he'll have that happen even in nations. God will allow things to happen in nations so we get our eyes off of materialism and off of the answers we think we have, and we get them on the only answer and the only hope, that is Jesus Christ. And Paul was converted, radically converted. And a wonderful story. We don't want to go back there. But when Paul was converted, I mean, he, he, he was totally changed. And then he said, I've continued unto this day. You know, the way to tell a real Christian is they continue. You know, Jesus gave the seed uh, and the sower illustration. Some seed falls on stony ground. Some fall, falls on the rocky ground. But some falls in the good soil. And it bears much fruit. And the way you can tell if a person's really been born again and really changed by the power of God is because they continue. They continue on. You know, they're kept by the power of God, but also they are, they're aware that they're gods. And uh, uh, so Paul was before them. Well, we're going to see tomorrow their, their trip uh, to Italy. They actually are transferred by this Roman gar garrison into uh, a ship that goes to Italy. And now, and then Paul finally makes it before Caesar. And that's kind of an exciting thing. We're going to see tomorrow in Acts 27 how Paul is sent to Rome. And what happens in Rome? But I'll tell you what, uh, it's exciting to see how God sovereignly works, as he did in Paul's life. He used the Roman leaders to protect Paul from getting killed by the Jewish leaders. And God had a purpose and a destiny for Paul, and it was going to be accomplished. He was going to make it to his final destiny. And if he would not have made it to Rome, we wouldn't have Ephesians, Philippians, Galatians, Colossians, First and Second Timothy. We wouldn't have had all those wonderful books that he wrote as he was prisoner there in Caesar's household. Just think of that. We would have been missing a good part of the New Testament if Paul would not have fulfilled his destiny. And I want to, I want to tell you tonight that God's going to fulfill your destiny. I don't know what it is, but God's going to fulfill it. We're going to pray for you right now that God does that. Father, in the name of Jesus, everybody listening that does not know Christ, may they, like Paul the Apostle, say, this is my moment of salvation. Lord, maybe a light isn't going to appear to them. Maybe they're not going to be knocked off a horse. 
But they're going to realize that Jesus is saying to them that he loves them and he wants to come into their life. And I pray right now, everybody listening would just open their heart and say, yes, even as Paul said, I was not disobedient to the heavenly command.